Hello and welcome to this episode of the Chemistry Made Simple podcast. I'm Matthew McCario from Chemistry Made Simple. This week we're going to be talking about quantum mechanics and helping to understand this bizarre concept. So in this episode we're going to define what we mean by quantum mechanics. We're going to make some real world comparisons that will help us understand how quantum mechanics compares to the everyday world around us. So we'll talk about using the escalator or stairs and we're going to talk about quantum coffee. We'll also move on to introduce quantum numbers and what they mean, how we use them. So firstly, what is quantum mechanics? And we covered this a little bit in last week's episode. We said it's a branch of physics. It describes the behavior of microscopic particles, by which we mean the tiniest particles that you come across, atoms, electrons, photons, and other extremely small particles, particles you can't see down the light microscope. When we're applying quantum mechanics in chemistry, we use the Schrodinger equation instead of using macroscopic equations. That's because the tiniest particles just don't behave the way that we expect them to. They don't behave according to classical mechanics or the way that Newtonian mechanics tells us that they should. But they do behave according to wave equations such as the Schrodinger equation. In order to understand how different things are compared to our world around us, we need to consider a few comparisons. So let's consider the escalator or stairs. If you try and get between the floors in a building, you might use a ramp or an escalator, or you might use the stairs. Our classical, our everyday world could be compared to using the escalator. At any snapshot moment in time, as we're traveling up or down that escalator, we might be at any level. There isn't any definitive levels that we could be at, so we pass through every point on that slope as we go up or down during the period of time that we're traveling. How about if you use the steps to get between the floors? Well, if you do that, you're going to be on one of the steps at any point in time. You're not going to be at any point. You're going to be at step one or step two or step three or whichever step that you're going to be on at any snapshot of time. You can't just be at any level. You have to be on a step. And that's how quantum mechanics works. Everything has got fixed levels. So this is our quantum mechanics way of getting from one floor to another because we have to be at one level or another, at one step or another or another. We can't just be on a continuum because quantum mechanics doesn't work on a continuum like the things we see around us. Let's talk about another comparison and this could be the sweetness of our cup of coffee. So we might have a classical coffee or a quantum coffee. If you're having a classical cup of coffee, you would use granulated sugar to affect the sweetness of it. So if you do that, you can use any size spoon you like and you can put as much or as little of that sugar into your coffee and get it to any level of sweetness between unsweetened and sickly sweet. You could have it on a continuum, basically. But if you use sugar lumps to sweeten your coffee rather than granulated sugar, then your choices are more limited. You can use no sugar or you can use one lump or two, or however many lumps of sugar you want to use, up to the point where the coffee's saturated. And you'll have sweetness to the level of however many sugar lumps that was. But it's no longer a continuum, it's zero sugar lumps worth of sweetness, or one sugar lump, or two sugar lumps worth of sweetness. This is more your quantum coffee. And a number of sugar lumps that you put in that coffee and the number of steps that you are up that flight of stairs is the value of the quantum number for sweetness or the quantum number for the elevation between floors that you are. They're the settings of those characteristics, those situations. And whilst those might sound a little unusual for how we would describe things in the macro world, they do actually adequately describe those situations. And in the quantum world, we need those numbers in order to describe the behavior of particles. And hence, electrons and other particles have quantum numbers. Electrons have four quantum numbers, not just one that describes an energy level, but four. And these four quantum numbers are describing various behaviors of an electron. And these quantum numbers and their behaviors have quite an effect on our atomic model. So let's have a look at those quantum numbers in more detail. The four quantum numbers all have a name and a symbol that we use as an abbreviation. Also a function, a behavior of the electron that they apply to. 
which might be which shell is the electron in, or it might be related to the orbital that the, the electron is in, or it might be related to another property called spin. And then each quantum number also has a range of values that are available to it. The first quantum number that we use is the principal quantum number, and this is given the symbol n. And this is called principal quantum number because it describes the principal energy level of the electron. And that means that it's describing which electron shell the electron is in. There are values available of 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on in whole numbers. And conveniently, these equate exactly to the shell number. So principal quantum number 1 means that the electron is in shell 1, nearest to the nucleus. And an electron with principal quantum number 2 is in the second shell. The next quantum number is the angular quantum number, which is given the abbreviation L. And this describes the orbital that the electron is in. And the values for this quantum number range from 0 to n minus 1. In other words, the values available are limited by the electron shell by the principal quantum number n. So if an electron is in shell number 1 and the principal quantum number is 1, then the only value of the angular quantum number available is 0, which means there's only one possible orbital type that an electron can be in if it's in shell number 1. However, if an electron is in shell number 3, then the principal quantum number is 3, and there are values of the angular quantum number 0, 1, and 2. So an electron in the shell number 3 could be in one of three different types of orbitals. Then we come to the magnetic quantum number given the symbol m. And this describes the orientation of the orbital. And the values for this range from minus l to plus l in steps of 1. If our angular quantum number l was 0, we can only have magnetic quantum number value of 0. So if an electron is in the orbital that has angular quantum number 0, if it's in an s orbital, then there is only one orientation for that orbital. However, if the angular quantum number was 1, then the magnetic quantum number could be minus 1, 0, or plus 1. That means there are three possibilities for an electron in an orbital that has angular quantum number equaling 1, in other words, a p orbital. So there are three different shapes, three different orientations for a p orbital. And these three quantum numbers describe the shell and the orbital that an electron is in. The fourth quantum number is the spin quantum number, given the symbol S. And this describes a behaviour that is related just to the electron itself and not to orbitals. So electrons have a spin property which has two possibilities, which we describe as being spin up or spin down. And the values available for this quantum number are always plus half and minus a half. What's the relevance of this quantum number? Well, it's possible to have two electrons in an orbital, but they must have different spin. An orbital can't have two electrons that are spin up, uh, or it can't have two electrons that are spin down. When an orbital has two electrons, they must be one spin up and one spin down. And so the two electrons within an orbital must have opposite spin. Now those might all sound quite confusing, but actually we'll only really be asked about the principal quantum number n, the electron shell number. And this is the straightforward one that just tells us which electron shell an electron is in. You may be expected to recognise this from the symbol n or from the name principal quantum number, and you'll be expected to know that its value is equal to the shell number that an electron is in. So how do we use quantum numbers? able to use them to help us understand the shape and structure of orbitals and atoms. Also, the available orbitals and their shapes, and how many electrons they can accommodate as well. So, all those numbers are used to, to describe the shape of the electron orbitals, the electron shells, the atom. And it helps us to understand bonding, bond angles, and so on. So this has been quite a lot of information to take in. And don't worry, you don't have to have remembered it all or written it all down. 
I've prepared a download that you can get hold of. Just go to chemistrymadesimple.net slash quantum. In our next episode, we're going to talk about what are atomic orbitals. We're going to talk about them more and their shape. If you haven't already, do subscribe in your podcast player, and then you'll be able to listen to this valuable episode. So I look forward to you joining us next week, and we can talk about those electron orbitals in more detail.